experience of it um, proved to be a genuinely thought-provoking conference and it's not yet done. So we have our final panel addressing the crucial, crucial question of the distribution of responsibilities of private actors in international law and that's immediately uh, following this discussion. So we have the privilege now of hearing from colleagues from across Scotland whose insights will help us to think collectively about the theme of the conference, international law and distribution. Though sadly, an unavoidable issue has meant that one of our speakers, Sufyan El Drubi from Dundee University, is not unable to join us for this session. Now, our speakers will speak to their particular interests, but during the discussion, we will all, so that is the panel and the conference participants, try to think about and address larger questions raised by the conference so far. Because time is brief, I'll keep introductions minimal, not least because our panelists will be saying something about their areas of expertise in the course of their comments. So we have Deval Desai of Edinburgh University, whose interests and methodological inquiries have centered upon expertise and notions of governance. Annalisa Savaresi from Stirling University, who will speak to her expertise in environmental law and rights. And Christian Tams, who will today talk more about insights drawn from practice within courts and tribunals, particularly re relating to investment law. And just to place myself, I'm Charlie Peavers at Glasgow University, and if time permits, I might abuse the privilege of convening the panel and add comment on some of the work that I've done that might be relevant to the question of distribution. However, before we turn over to the panelists, I do want to acknowledge the efforts of the organizers in curating such an expansive and varied set of papers and discussions already. And to do more than simply acknowledge this care and thought, I wanted to share with all of you some of the questions that were put to this panel to raise for discussion. Now, in classic international lawyer fashion, I'm going to do so both pragmatically and on a principled basis. So there won't be enough time to do justice to the intellectual efforts manifested in really searching questions, but also that we ought to keep these enriching questions in mind when we engage in our particular research, because they speak to the value of a distributional analysis of issues in international law. So just to give you a flavor, some of the questions we were asked. Why has international law not traditionally concerned itself with questions of distribution? Or has it? If so, how? How do current distributions in the academe and in the profession inform or perhaps even determine the development of international law? How in turn do the practices of international legal institutions impact upon distributions of income, resources and power in the world? To what extent is international law implicated in the current unequal distribution? And what is the relationship between the concepts of power and distribution? Now, there are still others uh, that we were invited to think about whilst also framing these interventions from our three speakers on their specialist um, experience and expertise. So I, I think that we could invite the organizers perhaps to add to the Q&A thread um, and I'm sure that they'll be willing to share some of their thoughts uh, once we've heard from our speakers. So Deval, if you would like to kick us off, that idea is that we have you somewhat constrained to eight minutes, but always slightly loose, um, so that we can leave plenty of time for discussion. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you to the organizers in, so it's a little bit difficult to thank the organizers in a non-rote sense. So I'm just gonna hope that performatively I can enunciate the fact that this is a non-rote thanks. It's really been a fascinating um, conference and this is a really, really intriguing um, round table to sit on. So I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity and um, I hope that um, there'll be a, a modicum of, um, uh, interest uh, from what I'm about to set out, um, and if not, I'll try to do my bit in the overall discussion. Um, so, uh, positioning. Um, I'm someone who thinks about and has worked on, um, at a scholarly level and a policy level, uh, law and development. Um, and my work has really drawn on distributional analysis and styles of thought. <clears throat> Again, both at a policy level, you know, that it's deeply enmeshed in doing policy work, thinking distributionally, 
uh, but also in some scholarly work that might veer towards the critical in a somewhat amateur way. Um, so the, the modes of thought that I've been working with are very frequently about winners and losers. Um, and in that respect, it's been great to hear the panels that I've been able to come to, but in particular read the abstracts, to see both sort of the styles of policy analysis about how law distributes, um, the slightly more critically inflected stuff on indeterminacy and background rules, and the way in which that uh, sort of complex or arrangement um, of a legal, uh, within a legal regime produces distribution behind a neutral veneer. So the sustainability panel um, uh, ju that just preceded this one um, really had that running as a theme. It's a theme in Nick Perrone's uh, piece. Um, uh, but also to read the really, really interesting stuff on the, uh, and hear the interesting stuff on the distribution of power to make those foreground and background rules, whether that's stuff about participation and consent or stuff about broadening the repertoire of legal forms that produce and, and distribute. Um, but so what I wanted to discuss really briefly today was a couple of projects that I'm working on that are trying to work out how to think about not distribution, but about non-distributions. Um, and to use that as a way of raising, quite solipsistically, to be honest, some of the methodological challenges that I'm confronting, but maybe also some of the edges, the slightly ragged edges of these sorts of distributional styles of thought. Um, and in particular, what I'm sort of struggling with is, can, can I think, and why would I want to think about non-distribution in a non-distributive fashion? Or perhaps slightly more precisely, how can I, or I kind of want to move in and out of distributional thinking in some of my works, uh, some of my work, and and how doable is that? Um, so let me just sketch out these couple of projects that have to do with non-distribution or the failures of distribution. Um, and one of them is very much about the administrative state. <clears throat> and this project is looking at a concrete empirical phenomenon of unspent social welfare funds in India. So these are pots of money that amount to the tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars that are collected through earmarked taxation for the purposes of pursuing a particular vision of social welfare. So, you know, um, uh, mitigating the detrimental effects of mining on mining affected communities. And these are put in particular legal vehicles like trusts to keep them from ordinary budget lines and ensure that they roll over year after year. And as I mentioned, tens of billions of dollars of these money, of these funds, uh, unspent, unstolen, and even gather no interest in India. So these are just about as dead as money can be. And so this is a story where the state gathers resources, often from large capitalists, in the name of pursuing social welfare, and then just doesn't distribute it. It just does nothing with that money. So that's one project. And the second project is more in the Register of Law and Development Activities. And there I'm looking at rule of law reform and sort of a particular modality of it where rule of law people and rule of law projects and practices repeatedly proclaim that it's totally impossible to know what the rule of law is or how to do it. And that that is a really constitutive part of the rule of law work. So you might develop rule of law indicators by arguing that it's impossible to develop an indicator for something as political and complex as the rule of law. So here there's a denial of anyone's authority to proclaim what the rule of law is or a concomitant denial of any distribution of that authority to proclaim what the rule of law is. Now, there's a pretty clear way to analyze these um, phenomena distributively, um, which tracks some of what we've heard in the conference. So the first will be, how do they in fact distribute? In India, who gets the small percentage of funds that are in fact doled out in the rule of law? What goals do these indicators establish? The second is to say that every non-distribution is a distribution, if you look at the background rules and politics. So in India, someone's going to use the money at some point, take a look at that. Or in whose interest is non-distribution? Is it a strategy to keep certain groups impoverished and as a reservoir of cheap labor and so on? Or in rule of law reform, even if people say they don't know what the rule of law is, mightn't that be strategic? Or mightn't there be in practice a distribution of who gets to design and fund and implement projects? which will actually instantiate concrete visions of the rule of law. Um, or maybe there's even an inequality in the basic discursive, epistemic, or ontological categories that feed into rule of law activities. So for example, sure, they say they don't know what the rule of law is, but they're not going to meaningfully engage with indigenous visions of the legal order. So those are very available and very potent um, moves with which to think distributively about these cases. 
But I kind of think there might be another dimension to these cases that I'm trying to grapple with. So the Indian administrative state continually proclaims that it is just too politically and administratively challenging, too complex to gather all the funds, move the money between the different arms of the state and spend it in accordance with the rules set out to structure social welfare, even as it raises money through taxation. Similarly, rule of law people continually proclaim the political complexity and impossibility of defining the rule of law, even as they pursue it. So part of the mode of governance in these two stories has something to do with engaging in this distributive enterprise to distribute money, to distribute the authority to say what good law is by proclaiming that the enterprise is just too complex and too political to do. So this, isn't, this doesn't map that easily onto something that is a seemingly neutral or te uh, technocratic process clothed in the language of the law that is in fact indeterminate and filled in by background rules. Instead, the governance process is all about embracing and sustaining the indeterminacy, the complexity, the deep politicization of the process. And I kind of wonder if there are specific effects of this that can't be reduced to distribution in the shadow of background rules. I guess, I'm, so this is a very loose description, but I might say that I'm thinking about the constitutive function that these failures to distribute might have. So in the context of rule of law reform, for example, I'm thinking about how these sort of ongoing, ever-changing reforms produce persistently provisional regulatory regimes, constantly subject to collapse and contingent reformulation in the name of avoiding some sort of overdetermined rule of law that's instantiated in um, different contexts, predominantly in the South. In India, I'm not quite at that stage yet, but I am interested in what a non-distribution administrative state might look like and what state society relationships it might produce. So methodologically, this might have something to do with suspending thinking in distributional terms. So to kind of pause that mode of thought, to try and understand these non-distributions as at face value rather than as a failure to distribute, um, and to understand them as perhaps constitutive of a particular form of law or legal regime. Now I should note that there's perhaps something to be said about this cropping up in the context of work in the global south, but I'll just park that as something for discussion later. But in any event, the sort of methodological concern that I have is about how to try and see these forms not to see them as failures of distribution, but as constitutive of particular forms, and then subsequently to analyze those forms in distributive terms. Um, but the methodological challenge for me, I'll, I'll just close with it, it's quite a simple one, is I, I wonder whether or how plausible that is in the sense that it's a, mo it's a way of trying to turn a concern with distribution into a method or an analytic, something that can be sort of flicked on and off, rather than as a style of thought, as a commitment to viewing law as technocratic, depoliticizing and mystifying, and then being committed as a scholar to demystifying it by showing the brute politics of distribution that um, hide behind that. And so in the final analysis, I'm just not sure how possible that is. Um, just to say that's something that I'm sort of grappling with or a methodological strand that's running through my work um, that if anyone has any answers for, I'd love to hear them. I think we call that staying with the trouble don't we, Deval? So the irresolution can be productive itself. That's fabulous. Thank you. And totally to time. Um, all right. So can I ask Annalisa now to offer, um, again, loosely around eight minutes, some reflections from your own area of expertise? Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, before I start, I thought I'd mention that actually since last week, I am professor of, associate professor of international environmental law at the University of Eastern Finland voice to maintain an affiliation with Sterling and will remain based in Scotland. So uh, I'm actually in Italy right now and my geographical situation is quite complicated as you may appreciate. But uh, I'm here to share with you my um, reflections on distribution in international environmental law, which is my area of expertise. Um, here the debate on so-called environmental justice has been rampant for quite some time. So the notion of distribution is clearly well embedded in that debate. Uh, and in the specific context of international environmental law, there are two rather diverse matters that come up. The first is the question of the distribution of natural resources and of the benefits associated with these. 
these matters have been addressed in a variety of international treaties, including the Law of the Sea, but also the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Convention to Combat Desertification in the International Treaty to, um, uh, sorry, on plant genetic resources and so on. Second, there is the question of the distribution of the burdens associated with tackling environmental challenges like climate change, biodiversity loss, and so on. In this context, state obligations largely hinge on the allocation of duties such as that to reduce emissions of pollutants, but also the distribution of financial resources, technologies, and know-how. As you may not be surprised to hear, the conversation about these matters is no less contentious than that concerning the distribution of natural resources. In fact, it's probably fair to say that the conservation and the distribution of the means to tackle environmental challenges in some international fora has overshadowed the conversation on the distribution of natural resources and access to natural resources. As some have already mentioned today, in the climate regime, the matter of the distribution of climate finance has been center stage for years, even though it's far from being resolved. From where I stand, international cooperation on this matter has largely failed, uh, and not much has happened since the famous pledge of $1 billion of climate finance first made in Copenhagen in 2009. So I hope you forgive me if I express my skepticism about the possibility of making significant process on this at COP26 in Glasgow. I'm however very willing to be proven wrong. Um, I will now like to briefly address the matter of the distribution of the benefits uh, derived from natural resources. As I see this as another interesting and peculiar feature of this area of international law. This matter has enjoyed much visibility recently as a result of the negotiations of the uh, international legally binding instrument under UNCLOS concerning the conservation of sustainable use of marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, so-called BBNJ for short. These negotiations remain ongoing and will resume in August. The research that I and others have carried out on practice concerning benefit sharing in international environmental law doesn't argue well for these negotiations, to be very honest with you. However, again, um, we wish for the best possible outcome. This is all we can do. Um, this brings me to reflect on something that many have mentioned already today, which is the relationship between sustainability, environmental protection, and human rights. I thought I'd say a couple of words about this theme because it's been at the center of my research and practice for quite some time. I remember when I first looked at the interplay between international obligations on human rights and environmental matters uh, 20 years ago now for IUCN. Um, conservation organizations really looked at this as a necessary evil. They did not really think this was their brief but um, uh, they nevertheless felt pressurized to engage with it. The 1992 Convention on Biological Diversity reluctantly treaded this path and made some rather coveted references to things like, for example, the rights of indigenous peoples in relation to natural resources and the obligations of states in this connection. The practice under the CBD clearly shows how, since the very minute these matters were mentioned in the treaty, even the terminology sparked intense and quite ridiculous sometimes debates, to be honest, at the international negotiations and meetings of the parties. But at least the CBD tried to address the issue of state obligations concerning the distribution of natural resources at home which other international environmental treaties largely ignored. So it's up to you whether you want to see this as a half full or half empty glass picture. Uh, what I say though is that in recent years, things have changed dramatically. Um, with the renewed interest in the right to a healthy environment and with the establishment of the related mandate of the special rapporteurs by the UN. 
And here the burgeoning debate on climate justice has also meant that environmental organizations have clearly jumped on the human rights bandwagon. We can see this in the recent turn uh, or human rights turn in climate litigation. Um, environmental uh, organizations happily rely on human rights to bridge the gaps uh, in the environmental law edifice, especially concerning accountability. Again, the Paris Agreement is a case in point. Its deficient provisions concerning the accountability of states have been supplemented by making resorts to human rights. Um, and this is just one aspect because it's not only about accountability, but it also matters like climate displaced people and the way in which at least human rights have been attempted to be used uh, as, as a tool to, if you like, bridge the gaps. So this is just to say that redistribution is very much on the cards with international environmental law. It's already part and parcel of it, although it's not done it well. Um, the troubled history of international climate law uh, shows how difficult it is to devise precise and enforceable international obligations on this matter. And here the limits of international law are truly palpable. And I'll leave it to that for now. Thank you very much for listening. Wonderful, Annalisa. Thank you so much. Um, all right. OK, so we have our final panelists and we are keeping perfectly to time. So Christian, thank you. Christine, can you, can sorry. you hear me um, now? I think I have an audio issue. I hope you can hear me now. Um, can you? Okay, I'm sorry for this. Uh, trying to sort of, uh, hoping still to keep us to time. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you to the organizers. I'm speaking as uh, an academic who works with international courts and tribunals um, and on, also as an occasional practitioner who works before international courts and tribunals. So that's the focus of my presentation in the next few minutes. Um, now that angle um, on distribution, of course, limits, because there's a lot more about distribution and most distribution issues and the way they've been flagged and raised in this conference are settled out of court. Um, and of course, also, uh, there's more to courts and tribunals than distribution. But I think still, it's a useful angle, because it allows us to shine a spotlight on the particular role that this actor or this type of actor courts and tribunals plays in the distribution, redistribution game. So that's my angle uh, for these remarks. And I'll try to make three points. Um, I will give you, first of all, if you want a pen picture of the role of international tribunals in one particularly prominent area that we've been discussing over the past days, and that's investment law. Um, I'll switch focus to um, a particular function played by international courts in another field, interstate disputes concerning resources. And then in the third uh, step, I'll want to step back and reflect a bit more broadly on what is it that we can take uh, from these two examples for the role of international courts and tribunals in the distribution, redistribution agenda. So that's the plan. Um, now, first of all, investment law and investment arbitration. That was the topic of panel six, to some extent, was featured in many panels, including panel eight this morning. I, um, I think I'm hopefully not going to repeat what others said, but perhaps speak to some of the themes that were addressed, notably by Inga and Kieran in panel six yesterday. Now, the starting point is that if we're looking at um, uh, the starting point is that in investment law, international courts or tribunals and investment tribunals in particular are very powerful actors, very prominent actors. They're heavily involved in scrutinizing decisions by state to interfere with um, investor rights or perhaps regulate economic matters, including in the resource sector. Um, so international tribunals are really a key pillar of the international law approach to this question of investment protection. Uh, it's a limited uh, role that international tribunals play, but a powerful one. It's limited because it's a scrutiny that comes in fact ex post facto and with respect to individual cases rather than preventatively. Um, and I would also say it typically is, is an intervention that can result in compensation awards, but not restitution awards, 
And de facto, I would say the investment arbitration regime is a mechanism that's only realistically available to medium-sized or big players. For small entrepreneurs, it's just far too complex and costly an avenue to pursue. Uh, so there are limitations. But I think what stands out and what stood out at the conference to the extent that I followed is that investment arbitration is a very powerful mechanism and a very prominent sharp sword. Um, and precisely because investment tribunals can impose upon states significant costs for decisions that are considered to be treaty breaches. Now, the decisions that are scrutinized are almost inevitably involved in distribution questions. Um, whether the fact that investors have access to this powerful, if limited, mechanism is in itself a distributive decision or a non-distribution decision is a matter of perspective. And I think, Deva, you hinted at that non-distribution is, I mean, any form of non-distribution is an absence of distribution and therefore relevant as well. So it's all relative. I would see investment tribunals as a mechanism, as key stabilizers, a stabilizing mechanism that, sta that shields the regime against a particular form of intervention by host states, a particular form of interference in aspects of the global economy. Um, now, because they are so powerful, it's of course only justified that the existence of this mechanism and the particular performance of this mechanism is now itself scrutinized. And I think Inga uh, Martin Kutis' paper had this title of whether investment law is fit for purpose. That's, of course, a question which is asked all the time now. Um, I would say that if we're proceeding from international law's traditional agenda, then I would say investment tribunals do what international law envisage them to do. They are key elements of an agenda that is based on the idea that certain forms of interference should be controlled and scrutinized. Um, a permissive agenda, you might say, that allows states or even encourages states to contract out, to sign off significant parts of economic control to other actors. So I think it's perhaps not the functioning of courts and tribunals that's the problem, it's the agenda that is controversial. And I think the concern is very much about whether that permissive liberal agenda uh, that international law has been pushing for uh, through investment protection law is the right one. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, where courts are situated. More briefly, um, the second angle, interstate disputes. Uh, how does it play out there? Um, I'll offer a view that looks briefly at interstate disputes about resources, um, because I think these illustrate another aspect, the pervasive role of state-centric international law and state control. In disputes about control over resources, control over contested spaces, we see um, courts in the classic role of umpires adjudicating over rival claims to territory or to spheres of influence. Um, and perhaps significantly, whereas in investment law, we see courts adjudicating about limits to sovereignty in disputes about interstate disputes about resources, especially in the maritime sector, we see courts taking a role against the backdrop of an international law that had massively expanded um, the state's right to exercise control over resources. Uh, this extension of state control over resources and reallocation is the result of the recognition of extended state jurisdiction rights, in particular in the maritime field. Territorial sea has been expanded, exclusive economic zone and continental shelf concepts have been recognized, which have been driven by a quest for resources and which have resulted in the significant reallocation of competence to coastal states. It's been driven uh, by technological advance, probably, but it's a massive reallocation of powers of control between states, which has benefited a particular type of states, coastal states. And it has resulted in a massive change of control over resources, whether that's fish, energy, uh, oil, or renewable energies um, in the maritime sector. So at the risk of oversimplification, I would say that in disputes about maritime spaces, states appear as sovereign and international law performs one of its traditional functions, that's of delimiting spheres of competence. Control over resources has been a key driver of this trend and international law has been the central instrument of the particular distribution agenda 
that international that has been pursued. Um, now, as an investment law, this is a highly controversial agenda, but I would say as an investment law, international law is reasonably effective at facilitating it, whether we like it or not. My final point, literally 30 seconds, what does all this mean for the role of courts and tribunals as actors in distribution conflicts? Um, I would say the two fields that I've looked at, investment and interstate resource disputes, look at uh, very different areas and follow different logics. One, we see expanded spheres of state control. Uh, in the other, we see a hollowing out of state control at the expense of granting investor rights. Both logics are given practical effect through the activity of international courts and tribunals. Um, and in both fields where international courts and tribunals become involved, they do so with a triple promise or the triple myth, if you want, of rule orientation, peaceful dispute resolution and depolitization. That's, I think, Deval, your term, the neutral veneer that the law offers, which it particularly promisingly offers in the field of dispute resolution through courts and tribunals. Now, I would say that despite these differences, what is common to both fields is that courts not only give effect, of course, to the agenda of international law, but that courts and tribunals shape the agenda. Because in both fields, resource conflicts between states and investment protection we're operating with incredibly vague general standards devised by treaty or customary international law, which only gain contours in the jurisprudence of international courts and tribunals. And so in that light, seen in that light, I would say the real redistribution that we see in my field is perhaps less between states and investors or rival states, coastal states and other states, but is one towards international courts and tribunals as very powerful umpires adjudicating conflicts over resources. Many thanks. Thanks so much, Christian. So what, what I'm just going to suggest now is, again, to invite everyone, all the participants, to reflect on some of the discussion that we've had. And if, we, if you'd like to put your hand up, there is the facility within the Zoom function to do that manually, rather, because we're over a series of uh, screens here. Um, or if you'd rather not, because as Alex said, the session is being recorded, you can place any questions in the chat. And whilst you're fulminating and thinking about the cross connections, maybe even with your own research or reflections on the panels, I might just ask um, all three of our speakers to, to think about um, each other's uh, papers. So Christian and Deval have, have already made some connections that I think make the link between these ideas of stabilization and certain assumptions that are drawn in as to the nature of international law and indeed public policy. And Annalisa, I suspect that that might also be in play in your own field of thinking about the redistribution of uh, resources and of burdens. So I wonder whether a, a theme there perhaps speaks to some of the underlying assumptions that are drawn as to say the rationality of public policy and the ways in which international law might feed into that, whether it's Christian's neutral arbiter um, or a form of permissiveness that nevertheless stabilizes in ways that are seen as, as sort of productive and, and positive. And Annalisa, it'd be really interesting to see then how your own field might produce something of a pushback to those kinds of ideas of stabilization, given that there is a sense of novelty um, and novel application that we see maybe manifest in some of the, the work that you've done. Uh, so that's just one provocation, but also I'd like to invite the panelists, um, maybe if we just go back around in the order in which you spoke, to reflect also on, on what we've heard. And as I say, if everyone would just like to continue to fulminate and, and add to the discussion as we go along. Thanks. Um, I guess that means that I'm up. Is that right, Charlie? <laughs> um, so <coughs> it, it's been really interesting to hear um, and think about that question of um, stability and novelty right? in, in the way that Charlie put it. So uh, just to go back to the rule of law reform stuff that I'm thinking about. There are a couple of different ways um, extant in the literature um, to engage with and think about these proclamations that we have no idea what the rule of law is, even as we try and build it. Um, and I just want to pick out two. One is that um, 
move to um, unpick and formulate the, um, the the sort of background operations, right? So what are the background rules? What are the background structures? Or um, looking from the inside, how do the processes and projects operate in order to stabilize some form of the rule of law, even though people are proclaiming that it's not really a thing, whether that form is, you know, persistent and, you know, technocratic or whether it's highly contingent and made within the project. Um, so that is to fill the gap in with a set of background rules, practices, processes. And there's another one that really embraces, and this often comes from the practitioners themselves, that really embraces the proclamations that they have no idea what the rule of law is as creative, disruptive, and productive of totally novel forms of, or potentially novel forms of the rule of law, whatever that might be. Um, but that I read as saying, not that we need to look at the existing set of background rules that can be analyzed distributively, but there will be some future set of rules, both foreground and background, that can be analyzed distributively. And I guess what I'm interested in is the um, ways in which the practices and people and stuff that I see um, continues to destabilize the possibility of those rules. So it's not just that it's either going to be totally novel or that it's an existing arrangement, but that it's perpetually provisional. Um, and what, uh, what does that express as a mode of governance? And is that something that can be analyzed distributively, I guess, is sort of um the the methodological challenge i guess that I'm, I'm sort of engaging with um which is to say that those questions of novelty and stability are folded into the process by which these rule of law people do their stuff and talk about the rule of law that's that's great deval and actually that it almost picks up on a panel that i managed to jump into and i think uh, which Akbar was chairing about temporalities and time. Um, and maybe maybe that panel might want to reflect actually on those comments and how they relate. Annalisa, did you want to come in now? Yes, thank you very much, Charlie. Um, as I already said, um, international environmental law has been fertile ground to mm, try and really address some distributive justice questions that underpin the whole international law edifice, um, more fertile than others, perhaps. Um, historically, there has been some political will to address these questions. Um, it comes and goes. Uh, the Biden administration, for example, has blown new wind in the sails of internationalists and wars that believe that international cooperation in this area should be expanded. Um, it is, however, important to remind ourselves that this is an incremental game and very little real change has happened over the decades since the Rio Convention. Um, so when one looks at the big picture, I think it's, it's important to understand that right now we are in a season where we are trying to make the obligations that states have undertaken already real and better implement them rather than creating a lot of new law. There is some isolated debates about new instruments, but it's fair to say that we are at the stage of consolidation of the international environmental law edifice more than uh, rebuild. And in this connection, some creative thinking has been made and some people are really pushing the envelope of how to make these um, obligations more operational in terms of distributive outcomes. Um, uh, whether or not it will happen, uh, it's really not possible to say, but for sure it's important to keep trying, if you ask me. Thanks. Thanks, Anselm and Annalisa. Christian? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you also. I mean, I think the temporality, temporality angle is key, as you suggest, Charlie. And I think it is particularly uh, what well, is peculiar, I think, with courts and tribunals, because at least in the two fields that I'm looking at, I would say courts and tribunals operate under conditions and on the basis of frameworks that were designed a generation or two ago, which today would presumably be designed very, very differently, but which are proving, like much of international law, very resilient. Um, so um, in investment arbitration, we see courts and tribunals acting 
uh, on the basis of treaties that were written in the 80s to 2000, which today few people would write in the same terms, but um, and with the same ideals, the ideal that going to court will be will be great, uh, that, um, I don't know, that international law, more international law should be conducive to more foreign investment and more foreign investment will in the long run be good for global welfare. I think, I mean, every step in the way or in the rationale of investment law is open to questions and dubious and not really borne out, but we, we operate with that system and courts operate at the apex of that system. And they cannot cut loose from that or are designed in a way that they don't want to cut loose from that. So I think that's a very, I mean, we have decisions coming down now which, which give effect to the logic of 1980s thinking. And that's, if you want, the charm and drama of investment law. Um, in, in interstate disputes about resources, it's a bit different. It's a bit more difficult to say this is all yesteryear's thinking. But again, we're looking at um, a distribution uh, of, of resources that was devised in, in lengthy debates between the 50s and 70s up to 1982. Uh, so if you want, um, made, well, affirmed in UNCLOS 1982 uh, and, and fine-tuned through decades of jurisprudence of international courts about principles of equitable boundary delimitation in the maritime sector. Again, at that point, this was perceived as a major redistribution agenda. Uh, coastal states asserting rights over resources for themselves at the expense of the Britons, the Norway, the Germanys, the uh, other nations who were deeply opposed to it. Um, but again, we're seeing that in place now, and that dominates the practice of courts and tribunals determining these decisions or, or making these decisions in the 2020s, uh, a form of uh, lawmaking that is shaped by the thinking of the 70s and 80s, I think to come back to Annalisa's point, now reigned in to some extent by, um, by environmental concerns, so it's not just all about resource scraps, but to just bring it home with perhaps one final thought, uh, Annalisa, since you mentioned the BBMJ treaty, I mean, it's difficult to negotiate. Now, 50 years ago, it would have been negotiated and had covered 50% more resources, so it would have been far more difficult. These 50% of the resources that are at stake have been allocated to coastal states for control. So we're operating with a system in which national jurisdiction has expanded massively as part of a generation ago's thinking about redistribution between states. Thank you. Just because I can't help myself with a reference to the past, we had a fabulous panel uh, that also went back to the 1950s to think about these questions of redistribution in the kind of material historical turn that, that we're still in. And as you're speaking, Christian, I'm thinking about those battles over even having forms of tribunal. So the nationalization versus internationalization debates that cut both across the substance, so what they're actually um, debating, or over the, over the tribunal itself. So an oil concession in the Arab region not being subject to any form of domestic law and that itself being recognized as a form of international, internationalization in the prehistory of, of the era that you're now talking about. Uh, so that's an abuse of the position. Uh, can, right, so can I ask um, any, any others in, in the audience if you'd like to come in with some questions? We do have time. Andrew, I know that uh, you've messaged me with, with some wonderful comments, so please go ahead. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, I mean, really just to raise one more comment, which I think is uh, one more issue, methodological issue, actually, in the end, which I think cuts across a number of the, uh, of the contributions, in fact, all three, um, all three of the interventions. So it's really just about um, <clears throat> what it... Uh, this move of inquiring into the distributional consequences of international legal structures or decisions and so on. And I think, I think um, very often that move goes something like this, that um, <clears throat> those, those who are in charge of building the architecture or making the decisions don't pay much attention to those distributional consequences and here we are, we're uncovering them and so on. And sometimes that's absolutely true. Sometimes though, I guess the point is that it's completely the opposite, that we have an absolute proliferation of claims about the outcomes, an absolute proliferation of professional and very formalized mechanisms for measuring the outcomes of governance interventions um, and uh, and doing something with those with those measurements um, and and with those um, with those causal claims about what the outcomes are, and I'm wondering, I guess, what it means 
because in the, what it means then to call attention to the distributional consequences of international law uh, in that context, right? Because that's a context in which every choice you make about the method by which you inquire into the outcomes, about the time scale you're interested in, about the nature of the effects that you're interested in, about so on and so forth, indirect, direct, all of them are already implicated in particular, already implicated in particular um, politics and particular governments, uh, governance um, structures in a way. And so I guess that's just to place that conundrum on the table and ask um, for reactions to it in a way. Great, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I might maybe just keep that floor open and see if we can have other contributions because um, time will quickly wind down. So would anyone else like to come in? Um, Gail, thanks. Yeah, I mean, maybe if I, maybe I'm just oversimplifying Andrew's point, but maybe if that question more went to the outcomes of distribution, I wondered more about the inputs to um, distributional challenges and I was thinking my question was really about uh, maybe the distribution of the microphone or the voices within your particular fields or within the particular case studies so for example in courts and tribunals the interesting move to have these side events alongside major ICJ cases and the youth voice in the environmental movement and then the different communities in India so I wondered about how the microphone is dis distributed uh, in your in your respective fields. That's great, Gail, thanks. And, and I think that helps also by bringing people back in. So part of um, some of the distributional discussions that we've had have sort of re-centered or decentered some of the objects that we're familiar with, uh, but bringing back the question of authority and of authoritative voice, I think, would be really valuable for our panelists to think about. Yuri. Uh, yes. Uh, um, uh, good day. I have uh, this uh, short comment. Uh, I'd like to thank organizers for excellent conference. In this discussion, uh, Deval uh, told very true story about the state uh, taking money via taxes, but not distributing uh, in the benefit of poor. Uh, in my view, it is modus operandi of contemporary nation state as machine of war and structural violence. Uh, and the international law doesn't change it very much because it is profoundly international. Uh, so it is focused on states, as uh, uh, Christian noted. Uh, and the nation state uh, uh, is no more progressive institution. Uh, more progressive uh, is uh, uh, individual charity uh, in redistribution. I shared in the chat the mathematical model of individual charity, uh, uh, but uh, 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 in International law, in my view, uh, uh, will uh, uh, be changed uh, following uh, the creation of new uh, knowledge and technologies about uh, uh, effective redistribution uh, via uh, uh, transactions uh, before uh, economic agents. Uh, um, in, why, uh, in one way or another, uh, international law uh, will transit to global law. Uh, uh, by establishment and disintegration of uh, hegemonic alliance of nations uh, like former empires, we see this uh, example of NATO. Uh, uh, by the rule of corporations, uh, uh, which are very hungry to seize this opportunity. Uh, 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 in the best scenario, after growing of uh, legal awareness of individuals in more peaceful, enlightened and prosperous humanity. Uh, so uh, uh, we should uh, think about how current transition from international law to global law can contribute into distributive justice. This is my short comment and I uh, uh, would uh, like to uh, ask, uh, uh, can any participants uh, um, comment this idea? Thank you. Yuri, thanks. And I think it's a provocation to, to, to all the participants, really. And sorry, I should have referenced the, the comments that you'd made in the chat that were also kind of in line with, with those views. And I think raised for us very helpfully the idea of constructing the intransigent and the compliant or the corruption versus the necessary failure, um, I think that Deval speaks to, 
or the bad and the good, um, and how nimble international law is in its various instantiations to somehow repeatedly manifest either the unintended consequence that enables the moving on or the simply, um, you know, it, it was all well-meaning kind of move. If I can just take the privilege to ask one comment about method, because you all three have, have raised it. And, and I think it, again, just goes to crediting the organizers um, and to think about what distributional analysis might bring to, to research on international law. So if we're thinking about this in terms of setting agendas, if we use the language, Christian, of agendas, and to think about what it does for us when we, because some of the papers in the panels have sort of talked about the ontological, right? The substance of seeing distribution and redistribution, but always entailed with that is this epistemological. So Yuri, in fact, you, you're raising this precisely in your comments by thinking about who is then commenting on, reflecting on, embedding certain forms of seeing when we look at some of these patterns of distribution and redistribution. And I say that because I just think I've found really useful this kind of, I do think it's a form of dialectical method that you're gesturing to here, that in a world of flux, what do we try to focus on? And maybe it's not the thing, but it's actually the mode of trying to see relational um, as being fundamental to international law rather than necessarily the thing. So that's a kind of provocation. Organizers, please step in if I've really gone over the mark there. Um, but perhaps if we could have just a few uh, comments in closing from our panelists, and then we do have an administrative announcement just if you can hang on until two. Thanks. So Deval, I'm afraid. To... Oh, well, Christian, yes. Oh, Christian, you know, yeah. Because I know you do need to shoot off, Christian, thanks. Okay, I mean, that's been very helpful and I think I'll not be able to cover all comments. I'll, I'll, I'll cherry pick and let my colleagues on the panel deal with the others. I'll cherry pick for themselves. Um, maybe, maybe three points. One is um, Gail's point about um, who is represented, who are the, the sideshows in particular, Gail, you refer to in international courts. I think um, we're seeing that. I think what I portrayed was perhaps a narrow vision of the role of the, the official role of international courts and tribunals, of course, there's much more to that. International courts as sites of contestation, as agents of um, bringing, um, of shining a spotlight, the court case as something that focuses attention, focuses injustice, perhaps. Uh, it seems to me that this is happening. Uh, it's significant. I mean, it, it's occasionally happening as counter history in investment arbitration now, where uh, an investment case is brought and a tribunal is, is sort of purports, purports to deal with it and the people involved in it don't realize that they're pursuing such a narrow agenda even though public interest may be at the heart of the case and then that's being brought in through amicus curiae statements or protests or staging of concerns at the process by which in inverted commas justice is administered in that particular field. So that is happening but it seems to me that, especially in my second example, interstate conflicts about resources, it's happening on the sidelines. And I think we're there, at least if we're focusing on the practice of courts and tribunals, we're seeing, uh, for, mostly for worse, a sort of a, a state-centric vision of international dispute settlement on display. And this isn't in itself anti-distribution, um, but it's distribution a la 1970s. Um, in the same way that the new international economic order would have been sort of 1970s, in some ways revolutionary and in some ways as old fashioned as you can think of it, because it was about states. Much more briefly, uh, maybe just one more point. Um, uh, Andrew, I think I'm picking parts of your big question about anticipating consequences and I'm adapting that to the investment context in particular. It seems to me that uh, here we're having to do with sort of very clearly intended consequences. It was a particular a set of actors who thought more clearly um, about the implications of devising a system, managed to devise a system of investment arbitration, uh, suggesting in good faith, sometimes in bad faith, that this would have globally good consequences, but very clearly of the view that by using allegedly, well, the neutral thin veneer, the thin veneer of neutrality, to value your term again, of, of arbitration, they would be able to bring it, to, to popularize it. And we're stuck with it and uh, sort of the system is criticized. I think we're seeing here, um, if you want, the far-sighted vision of a few and the naivety of many. And now we're stuck with a system that many don't like and, and the few prefer to keep. That's all I will say. And I will uh, add perhaps my apologies now because I 
had expected this to finish at 2 p.m. So to the extent it runs over, I may have to disappear at 2 p.m. With thanks to Charlie, to my co-panelists and to everybody listening in. Many thanks. Thanks, Christian. Annalisa, could we ask you just for a, a very short reflection and Deval also, I'm so sorry to truncate it. Yes, I'll be very brief. Um, I also would like to say a couple of words about the distributional consequences of international law and how much these are being monitored. International environmental law is um, reporting heavy. States report a lot of what they do to international fora and secretariats of various kinds. But even so, when we, for example, looked at the practice of benefit sharing in a project at Edinburgh University with Elisa Morger and other colleagues a few years ago, we were shocked to find out how little data, how little data exists on these specific distributional consequences. So even international environmental law is fully equipped to monitor these outcomes, sadly. Thank you, Annalisa. And Deval, thanks. Um, wow. <laughs> so the methodological questions are amazing and um, way more articulate than I could have managed. I guess the one reflection I'll probably end with is um, the methodological reflections seem to come from a place of wanting to study the relations, the relation relationality, Charlie, the surpluses, Andrew, the sort of thick complexity of um, the governance story to see the governance effects. And I guess I'm sort of also interested in the extent to which the opposite of that can be studied, the absences, the not happenings, the silences, without seeing them as playing against or deviant from the happenings, the relations, the surpluses. Um, so just to give an example of the consequences of that, um, to the question of how the microphone is distributed or what agency essentially is performed in these processes, in a lot of ways, that seems to be part of the modus operandi of this, this mode of, or it's important to the political modus operandi of this mode of governance. It's about, it, this mode of governance is about staging continual contestations over who can participate, who to be incorporated, the continual need to broaden out the types of voices that fold into the process. And in doing so, drawing attention away from um, certain aspects of the um, of not happening as a mode of governance. So in India, for example, it's deeply striking that social movements have focused a great deal of energy on inadequate revenue collection and um, not being able to provide benefits to specific social groups. Um, but not problematizing or thinking about or having their attention drawn, drawn to underspending as a broad administrative phenomenon. Um, so then uh, trying to uh, think about stage the not happenings um, without seeing them as um, deviant or moving away from uh, the happenings is something that I'm trying to struggle with. That's a fantastic note for us to end on, Deval. So, I mean, it just leaves me to thank our panelists and in particular the organizers again for really provoking all of us, I think throughout these two days to think more deeply about the question of distribution and international law. Um, and I do just have a moment to hand over to Nihal who just has a, a, a notice for us. Um, so thanks Nihal for being patient with us. No problem, thank you everyone. Thank you for this panel. Um, this is just uh, something that we wanted to let everybody know about, um, as you know, uh, the last two years we've had this as the Edinburgh Glasgow Glasgow Edinburgh event um, and we've uh, however always had an interest in turning it into much more of a pan-Scottish international law event uh, in and we've always as you can see from even this year's program attempted to involve as many Scottish law schools as possible uh, so in the next year we're, we're very happy to announce that um, uh, the Aberdeen Law School uh, will be will be taking up the baton and organizing uh, the next event. Unfortunately, it won't be able to consist of some sort of synthesis of Edinburgh and Glasgow in its name, but that's fine. Um, and we're very much looking forward to their, uh, to their uh, sort of carrying on in this event. So um, uh, Irene is here, Irene Koizogu, um, who will be uh, sort of convening the process of organizing this event. I don't know if you want to say just quickly, Irene, something. Uh, yeah. Can you see me? Yeah, thank you very much, Neal, for mentioning the organization of the conference at the University of Aberdeen. So I am a senior lecturer in Aberdeen, so we already have a topic, 
The topic is the following international law and technological progress. So I will uh, publish uh, in a few weeks uh, the call for papers and the date will be the end of June. So I don't know when exactly, but at the end of June. And hopefully the conference will be on campus. And you are all very welcome, of course. And I'm very excited in organizing this conference with other colleagues at the Law School in Abadi. Wonderful, thank you very much. And we look forward to keeping an eye out for the call. Well, that sounds wonderful. So thank you, Nihal and Irene, for sharing um, what will be a wonderful progressive future at Aberdeen and various instantiations of how we manage that uh, linguistically uh, in the chat, if anyone wants to look. All right, so we do have a few moments for you to go and stretch your legs and maybe get a coffee and then do please join us for the next session. So that's at 10 past four, when we'll be looking at distribution and international law, um, sorry, 10 past two, getting ahead of myself. Um, well, we'll be looking at distribution and private actors in international law. And I think, Anna, you'll be um, chairing that. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you there. <laughs>